Namaste. So, is everybody feeling a little nervous? A little anxiety? Maybe irritable? Huh? Something bugging you and you can't quite figure out what it is? Well, <laughs> it's retrograde season. And uh, just today, Saturn is stationing and will turn retrograde. Some of the other planets, I think Pluto is already retrograde. In a few days, Jupiter will go retrograde. Then Venus will go retrograde. And then, to top it all off, Mercury will go retrograde. <laughs> so, these retrograde planets bring up the issues around those planets in your natal chart. So, it'll be something different for everybody. But something will be coming up for everybody. And in the beginning, when the planet stations, it calls attention to these issues. And then when the planet actually moves retrograde, then it brings them up for resolution, or at least for reconsideration. So the next four months, actually, from now through September 2020, then these retrograde planets are going to be causing retrograde action in their various spheres of influence, which, of course, depends on where they are in your chart. So that's a complicated matter. But in general, we can say that society is going to be dragged back into the unresolved problems from oh, the last year or so and have a chance to uh, contemplate <laughs> and strategize and plan more lasting solutions because the solutions that we've got now aren't really adequate. <laughs> Confirmed. <laughs> So, you see, there are several things going on. And, of course, retrograde season happens every year for every planet. But because now we have a stellium or a concentration of planets in and around the sign of Capricorn in Vedic astrology, that means a whole bunch of them are going retrograde at the same time. This rarely happens, but it's because we have now what's called a Kalasarpa Yoga, where all the major planets are on one side of the axis of Rahu and Ketu. So these are difficult times in general, but then when all the planets go retrograde at right around the same time, it leads to big crisis. Because it's it becomes obvious that whatever solutions we have made to the issues regarding the last year or so are not adequate to actually solve them. So everything's going to be coming up. Uh, and this fits into a larger context, a much larger context of uh, macroeconomics and world history. Now, when we were in school, economics and history are taught as two different subjects. And this is one of the things that school is designed to do to make, you, to make us dumb. To make us incapable of understanding the actual world situation. Because history and economics are not a separate, not at all. In fact, to understand history, to understand geopolitics, 
you have to understand macroeconomics. Why is that? Because the wars that people commonly focus on as the uh, moving forces in world history are actually consequences of economic conditions more often than not. And I've been studying these two subjects, which re really are one subject. <laughs> and about two months ago, I shared with you some insights uh, from John Glubb, the British historian, about the life cycle of empires. And now I've discovered another author, and Ray Dalio is a macro economist and his and Glubb's studies go together just like that. They are the two sides of the same coin, history and economics. So by synthesizing these two studies, you can get a really clear picture of the cause and effect in the world today. So I've put links in the video description to both of their most important papers. So what is going on? Well, empires last typically around 250 years. This, well, 200 to 300 years, but on the average, 250. You can read that in Glubb's paper. And then they fail. But why do they fail? Dalio's paper explains that it's due to something called the debt cycle. Huh? There are two factors in economics, two principal factors, money and debt. Money is an expression of productivity. How much wealth can a society create through industry, work? And debt is a function of finance. Finance is basically market manipulation, where governments call into being money that doesn't really exist, wealth that is only abstract. See, debt is abstract wealth. It's based on a promise. And banks, especially now that we have a floating currency, fiat currency, and uh, what's that called? Fractional reserve lending. Huh? The banks expressly have a desire to print money. They can loan up to 10 times or more the amount of money they have on deposit. And of course, all this is contingent on their getting paid back. But what happens when there's a pandemic? A lot of these loans are not going to get paid back. This causes what's called a debt crisis. Now, we had a debt crisis in 2008. And that was a pretty good one, but it wasn't really the big one. Huh? The last big one was in 1929 with the collapse of the New York stock market. And that also happened because of overextended debt. People were in the market, but they were too highly leveraged. And when their uh, stocks went down, they couldn't pay back the loans that they had used to buy them. Uh, so a lot of people lost everything. People even committed suicide over it. Silly people. It's just money, man. <laughs> so anyway, these two things go together, production and debt. And when debt gets much, much bigger than production, there comes a time when the debt collapses. And of course, a natural disaster like a pandemic uh, surely is a trigger for a huge collapse. And we've seen that in the last few months. So turns out that these studies that I was making were quite prescient because now we seem to be in the middle of a major debt collapse. What does this mean? Well, it means that the government has to print money like crazy. And this is exactly what's happening. And it's not the first time this has happened. 
It happens every time there's a debt cycle collapse. In 2008, for example, the big banks were bailed out. But this one, <laughs> this one is different. This one is much more serious because it's not just confined to the U.S., it's global. <coughs> All currencies are being affected, but especially the American dollar, because the American dollar is a special currency called the world reserve currency, global reserve currency. It is the currency that is used to settle international debts, such as trade surplus or imbalances. For example, now uh, China has a huge trade surplus with the US. That has to be paid back in dollars. Because why? The sales were made in dollars. And oil, oh, this is the real mover. Throughout the whole world, oil payments are made between countries in dollars. This is all a consequence of the Bretton Woods uh, treaty that was negotiated at the close of World War II. So the international reserve currency being the U.S. dollar and all oil and balance of trade payments are made in U.S. dollars, this gives the U.S. unique leverage over the whole world and basically means that the U.S. has a global empire. But that empire is now unraveling. And if you read Glubb's paper, you'll see all the signs of a degenerating empire are present in the U.S. right now. I'm not going to go into the details. You can read it and do that yourself. But just, you know, read Glubb's paper and then look at the news, huh? Especially over the last few years. So it may happen this time around, or it may not happen for another 50 years. But at some point, something is going to push the debt cycle to such a high degree that the U.S. dollar as a world reserve currency is going to fail. And how do we know this? Because every global reserve currency so far in history has failed, has collapsed, when too much debt was taken out that is denominated in that currency. And because the debt doesn't get paid back, the banks holding the debt fail. And then the governments that uh, authorize those banks also fails. So this may happen in the U.S. And certainly it is going to happen. It's just a question of when. And another point is it's not going to happen overnight. But we can certainly say that this is the beginning of the end of the global hegemony of the U.S. So then who's going to be the next global uh, empire, the next global reserve currency? Well, if we look at all the different countries, now this is where Dalio's work comes in. If you look at all the different countries in the world, the previous uh, economic leaders such as U.S., Japan, and Europe, they have not only a debt crisis, but also a demographic crisis. There are far more non-working, older people in those countries than there are people who are able to generate wealth, young workers, especially people in families. But if we look at China, China is also on the verge of a demographic problem. And countries like India and Brazil and a few other countries, however, are demographically very powerful right now and will become more so in the future as the demographics of these other previous world leaders decline. So in our opinion, China and then India are going to become world leaders after the demise of the U.S. Russia is pretty much sidelined now. There has been. They will never come back. But India especially is well positioned to become the world leader 
in the very near future, within a generation. So these are long time scale things. I'm not trying to predict what's going to happen this year or next year. Uh, but sooner or later, these changes are inevitable. It just depends on the accidents of history, like this pandemic and oh, the upcoming environmental crisis to push these countries in the directions that are indicated by the research. Aung Tat Sat, Aung Shakti Aung.